Sherry Rasmussen. Uncovering the chilling truth of Sherry Rasmussen's murder case. On February 24th, 1986, Sherry Rasmussen was found beaten and shot to death in her home in Los Angeles. The house was in disarray and the police believed it was a burglary gone wrong. The investigation went nowhere and the case went cold for over two decades. However, when a fresh team of detectives took on the case, they uncovered a truth that was far more chilling than anyone could have imagined. Sherry Rasmussen was a 29-year-old nurse who worked at a hospital in Los Angeles. She had excelled at school and started college at the age of 16. By the age of 27, she worked as a director of nursing at Glendale Adventist Medical Center. Her friends and family described her as a friendly and kind-hearted person, always wanting to help others. Sherry met John Rutten a UCLA graduate engineer, in 1984. They immediately hit it off, and the couple started dating soon after. But the romance would soon reveal some baggage from John's past. John met Stephanie Lazarus at the University of California, Los Angeles. She was studying police science, and after graduation, she began working as a police officer for the LAPD. They had an intimate relationship, but it turned out that one of them was in it for more than just sex. Stephanie loved John, but for him, the relationship was just purely for the sex and nothing more. When John and Sherry got engaged soon after they started dating, Stephanie went into a jealous rage. She confronted John, telling him she loved him and wanted to be with him. John, on the other hand, had chosen Sherry and wanted to be with her. Stephanie asked John to have sex one last time to get closure, and John happily agreed, even though he was engaged to Sherry. John assured Sherry that there was nothing going on between him and Stephanie, and just after a year after their engagement, they were happily married. But their bliss would be short-lived. Stephanie went to Sherry's work in a rage, telling her that if she couldn't have John, nobody would. Sherry told her friends about the incident. She felt threatened by John's ex-girlfriend. Sherry's best friend, Jane, and sister, Teresa, were never interviewed in the investigation of Sherry's murder. On that tragic day in February, Sherry hesitated to go into work. She had a class that day that she didn't feel like teaching, so she told John before he went to work that she would call in sick. Later that day, John called home to see if Sherry had indeed called in sick, but there was no answer. He called her office, but nobody had seen her come in that day. He then called the house four more times, feeling anxious that Sherry didn't pick up the phone. His gut feeling would soon turn out to be right. As he drove towards their garage, he noticed that Sherry's BMW was gone. As he got closer, he saw shattered glass on the ground and immediately ran into the house. There, on the living room floor, he found his beloved wife, dead in a pool of her own blood. The LAPD was called, and they immediately started their investigation. John was taken in for questioning, as in most cases, the husband is suspect number one. After long interrogations and a confirmed alibi, they cleared John as a suspect in the case. However, the police were quick to assume that this was a burglary gone terribly wrong. Sherry was found in her red bathrobe, telling police that she didn't expect any visitors. The house was a mess, and a stack of electronics was placed by the door as if they were ready to be carried outside. But something was odd about this theory. The only things missing from the house were John and Sherry's marriage certificate and the silver BMW that Sherry got from her husband. Sherry's jewelry box was untouched. Sherry was shot three times in the chest and upper abdomen. 
A blanket was discovered near the body, and detectives believe it was used to muffle the gunshots. The police also found a bite mark on Sherry's inner arm, which later turned out to be the key evidence that cracked this case open 23 years later. Despite doubts raised about the burglary theory, the primary investigator in Sherry's case remained convinced that two male burglars were responsible for her death. When Sherry's father, Nels, suggested that the detective investigate one of John's former girlfriends, the detective noted the suggestion, but the lead was never pursued further. Despite the fact that the bullets found in Sherry's body were determined to be from a 38 caliber revolver, the same type of gun that Stephanie Lazarus had reported stolen just two weeks after the murder, there was no investigation into her as a potential suspect. Looking back, there were several errors made in the investigation. The lead detective narrowed in on one theory and did not follow any leads that would wave focus away from that. Sherry's closest friends were never questioned, which may have shifted the search toward Lazarus early on in the investigation. As the case grew cold, John moved away from LA. Stephanie Lazarus later got married and adopted a baby daughter. She became a respected police officer, working her way up the ranks. Her brother describes her as a loving person and devoted mother who could never hurt anyone. In the mid-2000s, crime went down in LA, and the LAPD had more time to work on the cold cases. DNA technology had evolved considerably since the 1980s, so there were much higher chances of solving these old cases. The LAPD formed a force dedicated to investigating unsolved murders, and by the year of 2009, Sherry's case saw the light of day. The new detectives on the case worked tirelessly through the files and stumbled upon a lead from 1986 that was never followed up on. A woman working for the LAPD was mentioned as a suspect by the victim's father, but the detective at the time chose to ignore it. When the swab taken from Sherry's bite mark was tested and revealed a female DNA profile, the new team of detectives decided to take a closer look at Stephanie Lazarus. They opened a confidential investigation since Lazarus worked in the same building. They followed her during her time off work looking for a possibility to collect her DNA. Lazarus got a cup of coffee, which he later threw in the trash. The detectives then collected the cup, sending it off to be tested against the DNA sample from the bite mark. When the test came back, they had their match. The DNA was without a doubt from Stephanie Lazarus, and the detectives had their killer within reach. In fear of tipping her off, they came up with a plan to disarm her before the arrest. One of her colleagues went to her for help in a case she was working on, and they went down to the interrogation room to talk to an informant. This was, of course, just a lie to get Lazarus to hand in her weapon before entering the room. When Lazarus didn't see any informants in the room, she got suspicious, but sat down with her colleague. He started questioning her about John and Sherry and her relationship with them. Lazarus answered reluctantly, and after a while, the detectives told her they got her DNA from murdering Sherry Rasmussen. Lazarus left the room in anger, and the police outside arrested her. 23 years after she murdered Sherry in cold blood, Stephanie would finally be faced with the consequences of her horrible crime. The trial began in 2012, and Lazarus' defense team tried everything to show her innocence. Still, the jury was adamant. She was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to 27 years to life in prison. This tragic case led people to lose faith in the police department. Fatal errors and a detective that was caught up in old habits led a killer to walk free for over two decades. Fortunately, thanks to new DNA technology and improved police training, more cases will be solved, and hopefully there will be fewer errors in the future. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. 
And as always, feel free to leave your thoughts and feedback in the comments below.